Hi, everybody. I'm with you now. Um, my name is Amy Gardner, and I wanted to welcome you all to session two of our three day training. And I'm just going to wait for a few more people to join because we have about 100 people who registered. In the meantime, if you guys would like in the chat to just let us know who you are and where you're from, that would be pretty fun as we all gather. In San Francisco right now, it's about 5 p.m., and we're having some coffee. So if you want to take a second and get yourself a glass of water or coffee, that'd be great. So we got people from Florida, Massachusetts, Vancouver, where else? Charlotte, Bellevue. Ooh, a rookie. <laughs> Cape Cod, exciting. Maine. Ho Chi Minh City, Sunnyvale, Bay Area, Massachusetts. Nice. Monterey, Mexico. Oh, hello. I think I know who you are. I'm very happy you're here. Excellent. Well, I'm going to take myself off the screen um, as a video camera, and I'm going to share my screen with you so you can see the presentation. And we'll get started in just a second. Just does that. Okay. <laughs> So, hello and welcome again. So my name is Amy Gardner and I have with me Allie Holmes who works with our mentors. I particularly work with coaches. I'm the director of curriculum here and we are into day two of training. I'm hoping that most of you were able to join us for the first session. And I'm hoping that Allie could maybe put a link to the folder where all these materials live. I also would like to point you guys in the direction of the materials because I have uploaded practically everything for today that we're going to be needing that you can download while we're in session. So that's some of the housekeeping I like to do. So yesterday we talked a little bit about the introduction about the program and the overview of what it's all about. And we started talking about your roles. And today we're going to do a deep dive into your roles and how to become an effective mentor or coach. And we'll look at student behaviors. I'm really excited to talk about that because I've been working in nonprofit education for a long time. And it happens to be one of my favorite topics. So yay for that. <laughs> and then tomorrow we're going to just talk a little bit about what App Inventor is. And we'll get a really quick overview of that and talk about next steps. Thanks, Allie, for putting up the link. So as we mentioned, we're going to hone in on some developmental characteristics. Um, I'm wondering if any of you work in education. If so, you could raise your hand, and I'll just take a kind of quick tally of who's, who's in education already. And maybe if you are, you can contribute in the chat room so other people can learn a little bit more about your experience when we get to that topic. And then we'll explore types of problems that students are interested in and the kinds of feedback that you can give them to contribute to a growth mindset, which is what we're all about here with the program. And then finally, we're, we're going to take a look at the kinds of apps that students have submitted in the past. And we'll look at one in particular that we thought was a pretty good example. So you guys have a benchmark when you're thinking and talking to your students on your teams about what the expectations are. So for that, it would be great if you guys could just revert back to the judging rubric. So you might want to dig that out now and just have it ready to talk about when we get there. So uh, last night, if you did your homework, which I certainly hope you did, but we'll talk about it anyway, was to go to a website that is linked to on the screen here, splasho.com slash upgoer5. And... The point of this exercise was for you to begin thinking about how to talk to your teams in a language they can understand about what it is you do at your job or a type of project you're working on. This will set the stage for you to be able to talk about technology at an age appropriate level to the students. So I gave you a really tough assignment and it was to describe your job. And I'm hoping that some of you did that. If you did, feel free to cut and paste what your the outcome of your assignment was. And I'll just give you a verbal example of, of what I did. So in my job, I'm going to talk to you as an adult right now, and then we'll convert this to, to the language of Upgore 5 
text editor. I work at Technomation and I work primarily with coaches. Technovation is a three three month program where girls create apps to solve problems, and they a long way develop a business plan, and then they pitch their ideas. So they're gaining twenty first century skills. When I did this in Upgoer Five, this is what it actually sounded like, which is kind of hard. So uh, the Upgoer Five is a is a thing you can use to. Um, kind of filter out words that are not in the top 100 used words in the English language. So you can imagine the vocabulary is pretty limited. And this is what it came out like. So I help give girls between the ages of 10 and 18 the chance to work together in teams to fix problems around the world. So the word program was not in Upgoer 5. So that was not in the top 1,000, which makes it pretty hard. The students use computers to do this, and the course lasts for three months. I also work with teachers so they can better help their students before and during the course. So again, um, this was used by a guy, he wrote a book called The Thing Explainer, and it's really neat because it explains scientific concepts using only these top 1,000 words. And I think it's a great exercise for anyone to do when they're trying to kind of break down complex things you're talking about in the curriculum, like what is programming? Um, so that's another thing to think about. So did, if anyone did this, like Susan, she says it was very difficult. A lot of the words that I tried to use were not allowed words. And Kimiko says, I work with young people to help them learn new ideas and think for themselves. So you see that you can get some kind of complex ideas out with the top thousand words. I think it's a great exercise to use. And um, before you begin meeting with your teams, you might want to just do this little translator before you meet with them, especially if you're meeting with middle schoolers who are on the younger side, ages 10 or so. They're going to be pretty savvy, but sometimes they don't get basic contact um, words like, like, what is coding? You know, they have a preconceived notion, and you're going to want to break it down. So that's pretty fun. Another thing I asked you all to do was to look, dig up some old photograph or evidence of yourselves as use, um, using some technology, if you have that. Here's mine, and um, I look like a baby there, but actually it's 1986, and the phone I'm using is really huge. It looked like a shoe, like Maxwell Smart, maybe. <laughs> and I think it's nice to have something like this when you first meet your group as an icebreaker to show them that you were once young too, and also to comment on what the difference is now between technologies that were used then and technologies that are used now, because that helps shape our mindset. And if you have a picture, um, actually bring it. You know, Don't just show it additional copy, additional version, because you can say, well, this was the technology that was used at the time. So I also pointed to the Beloit Mindset List from 2019, and that's also in the materials if you want to download it. There's a link there. And I'm just going to highlight a few of the cool things. This is a list that this college makes every year to help professors know what their student population is going to be like. So this 2019 group would theoretically be in high school right now. And some of the things on the list that I found that were cool were cell phones have become so ubiquitous in class that teachers don't know which students are using them to take notes and which ones are planning a party. Um, the announcement of someone being the first woman to hold a position has only impressed their parents. So more and more people are getting used to women in leadership roles. Um, students 2019, they've grown up treating Wi-Fi as an entitlement. And they truly do panic sometimes when technology isn't working for them. Um, this is going to come up in your troubleshooting for when they're working on their apps. And, some, you know, there's a bug or something. And we have to help them with their patience when it comes to that. And number four on the list was email has become the new formal communication, while texts and tweets remain enclaves for the casual. And Google has always been there to organize the world's info and make it universally accept, uh, accessible. I remember um, in 1993, so maybe seven years after that photo I showed you of myself, email came out and I was really resistant to using it because I didn't think it would catch on or something. 
so these things are kind of fun to, to muse about. Um, anyways, I really suggest looking at this because it can help you if you're having, you know, high school students especially may look at you and they think everyone's old, even if they're five years older than them. So it helps to try not to be their best friend or something, just be yourself, but know that these funny, oftentimes things exist as cultural touchstones in their lives. So we're going to look a little bit at student behaviors, and we're going to start with middle school. So if you guys can raise your hands if you're working with middle school teams, that would be great. I'm just really curious. I'm going to look in the attendee dashboard here. So we got a few hands up. Nice. You'll also notice in the materials section of, of the chat area that you can download the middle and high school behavioral guides. And just looking at this picture, do you guys want to write in the chat, um, when you look at this picture, what does it evoke? What kinds of girls are we looking at here? What do their ex expressions say about themselves? What does the sign say? What does their environment look like? You can tell a lot from a picture, but you sometimes don't know. <laughs> so pride is something someone responded. Happy and curious. And if anyone has middle school girls in their lives, empowered, excitement, sure, meaning ages 10 to 14 if you're not in the U.S., why don't you just write in the chat room what they are like, you know, what characterizes this age group? Nervous, artistic, sure, empowered, yeah. Um, someone wrote moody earlier on today, and I think that's definitely true because they're going through some hormonal changes. A lot of times when you're working with middle schoolers, the girls will be much taller than the boys in this age of growth for them. And if you take a look at the middle school developmental guide, um, in their development, they're socially aware. Um, they're still kind of goofy, sometimes a little moody. They're learning words that sometimes they don't know what they mean and they try them out and talk about them, but sometimes it's totally out of context. Um, they're desiring more and more independence. Christy says they're self-conscious. Kiara says emotional. Megan says fast thinking. All of these things are true. I love working with middle schoolers because they still have one foot kind of in childhood and one foot in adulthood. And they're always looking for a killer app. So. Chances are they're going to already want to come up with a solution before they identify a problem or they'll be thinking about their world and they want to solve a really big problem like the environment because they're learning a little bit about geography at that time too, but you're going to need to help them narrow it down and we'll talk about that more. Um, at this stage in their, in their studies, they're learning how to develop a hypothesis. They're studying ecosystems and planet Earth. If anyone is here and is a math teacher or a science teacher, it'd be great to just talk about what subjects you know that middle schoolers are learning. They're also learning about ancient civilizations, and they're starting to go beyond their, their, their world, their kind of locality, and looking at how things relate to each other. And they're learning more about abstraction. So that's pretty fun. Um, they're also entering adolescence. So if you got any tweeners in your life, you're going to know that they're on the phone a lot or texting their friends and trying to begin to set themselves apart from adults. But they really do still crave adult kind of security and um, being around adults and trying to please them, which is nice. <laughs> um, they're learning about evolution, they're learning about numbers, biology, algebra, um, the solar system, the higher they go towards eighth grade. And they're also learning the scientific method. So they're learning how to ask questions to form a hypothesis and evaluating results and conclusions and sharing their opinions. So friends and classmates are their world to them and they still try to please adults. This picture is of a team that was actually featured in India, and I believe they're from the same place as where the movie Slumdog Millionaire took place. That's what I've heard. And I really like their, their logo on the poster they made, Girls for Change. And you'll see um, that our organization is all about Girls for Change in many ways. Any questions about middle school? Are all you guys feeling confident about working with your middle schoolers?
I would hope so. Raise your hand if, again if you're feeling confident about working with your middle schoolers. Also, um, after we meet today or even during the next few weeks when we hold sessions um, to talk with coaches and mentors about what's going on in the curriculum, you guys can always meet up with us. And if you have specific questions, we'll be sure to do our best to answer them. So I think my girls are smarter than I am already, says Megan. <laughs> Yeah, um, a lot of them, some of them might be more tech savvy than we are, and that we might learn a lot from them as well. So it's a mutual learning experience, which is great. But again, you'll have um, adult kind of hindsight <laughs> to help guide them, and and their critical thinking won't be as sharp as yours, I'm hoping. <laughs> so, so we do have some things on our side as adults. Uh, I need to help my daughter sometimes. Adriana says, I think we become facilitators more than teachers. They teach us every day, too. Yeah, so that's a really important thing to remember, is that you're going to be learning probably even maybe more than what the students are learning, which is great. Uh, my first year, they went way beyond my capabilities in only a few works. It was all okay. That's good. That's a good attitude, Audra. So now we're going to move on to high schoolers. Okay, raise your hands if you are working with high school teams. I'm just going to do a quick barometer of who's with what. Oh, I see. Whoa, there's a lot of hands. A lot, a lot, a lot. Okay, good. We're going to talk about high school now. Oh, hi from Tunisia. Nice to see you. Um, when you guys look at this picture, what does it evoke to you? in contrast to the middle school picture. Obviously there's more people here and there's boys, but what do the actions say in this picture? Um, Ignatius says wild. Jonathan says opinionated. They have signs. Yeah, they're there for purpose at probably a rally. Brave, free to speak their mind, invested, confident. Keep them rolling, people. <laughs> Enthusiastic, yeah. So, yeah, they have a voice, and they're using it. And you'll find that with high schoolers, they're starting to really differentiate themselves from the adults. Um, they may still like adults, but they're probably not going to want to associate with their family with adults as much as with strangers. Um, so mentors or coaches working with students who are not their parents may have a kind of leg up in this relationship, which is good, because we want to get them engaged with multi-generational people. We want them to be working with adults in a really positive, constructive way. So they knew what they want and when they want it. <laughs> yeah. So if you take a look at the high school developmental guide, these guys are between like 14 or 15 years old and 18 years old. And, and I should mention that the students taking part in the challenge should not be at university level, even if they are 17 years old or 18 years old. This is purely for high school or secondary school students. So where are they in their development? They are um, hormonally changing, just like middle schoolers. Um, uh, girls can typically get a little bit shyer or a little bit more inhibited. They've got a lot going on socially, so their extracurricular activities are going to be taking up a lot of their time, especially in the U.S., they're studying all sorts of cool things in school, like journalism, humanities. They can take electives like biology, chemistry, physics, economics. So they're piecing together where, you know, how things come together to, to change culture. And in school, in the sciences especially, they're learning investigation and experimentation, logic and evidence, um, models, scientific evidence, analyzing problems causes and effects of World War One and Two, So they're getting into critical thinking mode here. And this is where the entrepreneurial side of the curriculum will make a lot of sense to them because some of them will be working. So they'll have a realistic relationship to money or maybe not, but at least they'll have some experience with it that middle schoolers might not have. Are there any questions about high schoolers? Are you guys all confident? I'll wipe the, the raised hands again. Are you guys who are working with high schoolers confident that you will be able to work with them well in our program? I'm seeing a lot of hands up. I think that's great. 
a lot of you are educators, and that's really nice. So um, I'm hoping that the educators can definitely chime in during this session and let us know if there's any issues that the mentors perhaps should be aware of. That's great. All right. So let us now talk about some of the roadblocks that come up that we've heard about. And working in education, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of these too. Um, some of the major things that come up are, how do I help manage group dynamics? How do I keep my team on track? So to that end, um, the developmental guides, you can be using them as cheat sheets. Um, some tactics are to help manage dynamics. What are some of the problems actually that you guys have encountered if you've worked with Technovation or students before? What are some of the key issues that come up in group dynamics? I'll let you guys bring up those, some of those points. One of the major um, personality conflicts, shy, shy or quiet, miscommunication, distraction, all these great things. Um, <laughs> so let's tackle them a little bit one by one. Um, in order to help get all the girls to speak or, or participate, it's really good to to ask them to participate. If you hear a lot of quiet and one person is dominating the conversation all the time, one way that you guys can get around that is to ask the others to contribute. Or if they're brainstorming or something, you can ask them to write down questions or points or whatever on stickies so that they can write down their ideas and not have to contribute verbally at first until they're really comfortable talking. Um, you can also give them different roles on the team, and we'll talk about that. If one of the students is really great at making art, maybe that person should function by making a logo or doing some of the artwork that's associated. If one of them is really great at engineering and coding, then maybe that student should work on the code. We, we do want to encourage a lot of the students on the team, at least, to also learn code. So I do suggest paired programming, so two people on a team doing that would be really great. Um, throughout history, we've seen examples of women working together to debug each other's problems on old computers, stuff like that. So oh, Amy Lee says, all of my girls want to code. Well, that's a problem that I think we'd all like to have. <laughs> but yeah, you should definitely make sure that they, they can take turns or maybe alternate. Um, they can, we heard from people from App Inventor last yesterday and they said that they can share passwords, they can share files. Um, Kelsey says a three then me rule works well in a group of younger girls when some are domineering. So yeah, that's that's a great tactic. Um, one member doesn't speak again until the rest have. So that's really good. Um, are there any other things that I'm missing? Um, Role definition, definitely. We're going to get to that. I created a resource that I'm going to share with you in just a minute. It's called a tracker spreadsheet. And that's also in the materials. And I'll also be sending these out after. It's funny, I'm hearing someone else's mic. <laughs> Hold on a sec. Okay, so um, you'll see if you call up this, this timeline or spreadsheet, or you can just look at the screen. This is how it's laid out. There's five tabs. And one of our mentors from last year shared this resource and I kind of co-opted it and turned it into something you guys could use as a template. And it's pretty simple. So I just numbered the units and I wrote the week and you'll see the date April 21st is there for submission. I definitely suggest submitting earlier if possible because you don't want to find yourself in a situation with your team where they're panicking because the connectivity is not good or something happens. So these things can be created. All the deliverables we're going to talk about, they can be submitted in advance. And I totally recommend it. Um, uh -huh. And the next one is team roles. So I, when I worked with a similar program before, we had students divide into roles like the ones you're seeing on the screen. It seemed to work pretty well, and you guys might have different ideas too, so feel free to contribute. The team leader, um, there is a team leader. That could be a project manager. Takes charge, for example, the project, keeps it on track, lets the students on the team know if meeting times change, uh, 
can help lead team discussions, uh, ensuring that ideas and explanations are coherent, explaining and, and helping to educate the others. This could also rotate. So if there is one domineering person, maybe one week that person could be the project manager or, you know, they can shift roles a little bit. So marketing would be potentially responsible for the logo and the pitch and investigates the market for the app, um, helps with the pitch, helping to make the pitch very persuasive. So these are the communication skills they need. Why is the app important and innovative? You know, making sure that they don't reinvent the wheel, like don't make another Fitbit or something, you know. A lot of students want to solve certain similar problems, and sometimes they don't do enough research, and they don't realize that something already exists that meets that need. So we want them to be innovative, and the marketer helps point out what is innovative about that solution. Um, the marketer also identifies people who would be most likely to be interested and helps make surveys and stuff like that. And you'll see an example in a pitch demo video in a few minutes about what that's all about. The finance person, so that person helps with the business plan, potentially decides or researches how much money it would cost to actually launch the app, um, thinks about what it would cost for the users. You know, maybe there's a deluxe version, maybe there's some, you know, a free trial, I don't know. Thinks about things, you know, to make it viable in the marketplace and to launch it to market. And then the engineer would be coding, potentially, or fixing bugs, or figuring out the technological needs and help problem shoot, problem solve those. The designer is also a cool job. So if there's any artistically inclined students, they, they think about the human computer interface. What is the UI, the user interface? What's the look and feel? Um, that person would work with the marketer. Some of these roles would interact with some of the other roles at certain times during the project. Are there any roles that um, you guys can think of that I don't have here that you might like to include? Definitely feel free to use this template as you want to. This is just suggestion. <clears throat> so in the third tab, we have final deliverables. So we'll talk about these in detail later, but basically they are source code, and that could be App Inventor, it could be Swift, it could be Java, it doesn't have to be App Inventor. Pitch video should be four minutes or less and posted to YouTube or Vimeo. Um, an app demo video, two minutes, so it's just showing you what, what actually happens on the phone on the prototype. Screenshots, so three to five screenshots of the app prototype. The business plan in a PDF format. Um, the 100 word app description. The photo of the team with mentors and coaches and the post program survey, which you guys will get. Um, make sure it's the pro it's the project manager's job on the team to make sure that these are delivered and also that everything aligns with itself. Sometimes students forget to update something and you know it doesn't really correspond to everything. So keeping an eye on all that, like a, a project manager would in the real world. And then. I just created some some unit resources or whatever. I, I started populating it for you guys with a video that you might be able to get to, but you should know about anyway, about the science of character. So it talks all about 21st century skills and how to build character while you're giving them skills they need to learn STEM and other sort of subjects. And then finally, there's events. So. We talked about this yesterday. There's Girls Make App events where it's kind of like a hackathon or, or you get together with a local group and you learn a little bit about App Inventor and do some tutorials and then potentially brainstorm what a problem and a potential solution could be. So um, do people switch around team roles over the course of 12 weeks or do girls each choose one to act I think this depends on the team. It's probably better to have them retain the same role throughout, but if they're all wanting to do, you know, experience what it's like to be the designer on the team, experience what it's like to be the engineer, et cetera, then if they're mature enough to switch roles, I say, go for it, you know, let them see how it's working, but keep an eye on it because ultimately 
I think they really do need some guidance from adults, and you guys would be the perfect people to give them that input. Um, this is a great question from Gizlin. Do we need to prevent coaches, mentors doing the work? Yes. How to prevent the temptation from doing it yourself? This is something parents go through time and again. So we really want the students to be creating the deliverables and making sure the students are the ones who submit the deliverables. So they need to know that from the start that you're not, you are going to help them problem solve and troubleshoot, but you are not going to be creating the code for them because it's their job to learn that. Okay. So, oh, I forgot to mention the other events. So field trips are really great. If you want to um, do some ice breaking activities with your group and invite them into your office space, if you can, if you're a mentor, that's great because then they can see what the environment is like where you work. You can talk about the kinds of problems you're solving at work. There's lots you could do. So maybe spend an hour or two, if you can, and, and invite them to your office. And the pitch party that happens to, um, after April 21st, after they've submitted everything. So we don't just want the program to end in a vacuum after they submit. And if they don't get accepted to the semifinals, we still want them to have a positive experience at the end. So it's really important, whether you do it formally or informally, to have some sort of celebration with your teams and let them know that you still care about them and that they can still reach out to you with questions on continue, continuous work on their apps. Because one of the end goals is to actually launch their app. So even if they have a prototype, they can still be making improvements to it. And it's part of the experience overall. So yes, um, Audra asks, have you thought of having webinars for students and women in these roles? That's definitely a possibility. So Ellie's nodding yes here. Um, she works with mentors specifically, and she would be a perfect person to ask after this. And we'll also point you to a resource, with, which is the Google group for both mentors and coaches. All of your brainstorming, that is the best place to do it because it's public and other coaches or mentors can see what you're saying. And we'll have a record of these conversations. So we talked a little bit about the deliverables. Um, and I think we should tie this in a little bit with what the students are interested in. So if you look here, you can see four examples of what students are interested in. And hopefully judging by the logo and what it's called, you get a better idea. So in the past, we've seen drunk driving is an issue that they care about because they're learning how to drive in high school. Um, concussion checking is really important. That whole issue has blown up not long ago. There's even a movie out about the doctor <laughs> who, who brought that issue to light. Um, books are important to them, luckily, still. Um, <laughs> so reading. Um, other examples of topics of interest were camps, so summer camp search. Any other things you know your students are interested in? I know in some countries, um, Getting rid of waste is really important and finding the team that won last year in the high school division dealt with that topic. Video games, yes. So uh, the point, the actual theme of this year is solving problems in your communities. And last year, a Brazilian team made it into the finals, or was it semifinals, Ellie? Um, anyway, there is a Brazilian team who created a game to help solve a problem. So the, the problem was how do we conserve water? And that's really cool. So you can let them know that they can devise a game as long as it's an app that solves a real problem in the world. So music's really important. Raising funds. Oh, yeah. Some of the students are really interested in finding ways to help um, volunteers. So help people get connected to causes they want to volunteer with. That's great. Um, a lot of them think about safety for women or other issues that are specific to girls and women. So that's neat, too. The really cool thing about this program and what makes it so special is that you see through the submissions what all is going on in the world and what interests these kids, because they're going to be the ones solving our problems in the future. So we want to equip them to do that. Um, so I covered the deliverables a bit, but I wanted to just go into that a little bit more. 
because some people think that they can might possibly only be able to submit an app inventor, but they can also submit in whatever code that they create the app in. So if it's Java, Python, um, Swift, any of those are okay. We work more closely with App Inventor, and App Inventor is the easiest one to learn if you don't know much about coding. So just know that from the outset. Um, we want three to five screenshots of the app. We want a pitch video, uh, one that tells a really good story and illustrates why the, the issue is so important, and then tells how it, solve, it gets solved. Um, the business plan, you'll see examples of all these, and a team photo. And what's really important is a post-program survey because we want to know, and along the way too, if you want to just email us and let us know where especially your team is having problems, we want to be able to help with retention because a lot of, some groups don't actually make it to the end. And we're thinking it could be caused by a lot of extracurricular activities or maybe the curriculum is hard and they need to have perseverance. So this is where you guys are going to come in, especially to help keep them on track and keep them motivated. I mean, we've all worked on projects before, and all of us have lost motivation at certain times. I don't know anyone who hasn't. If you exist, that's really great. <laughs> but if you can provide examples of your, your work situation and when things have gone, could have been a potential failure, and you can talk about how you overcame that, that's going to go a long way with these girls. So these are life skills that you're helping them learn to succeed. So what I thought we'd do now is take a look at one particular team and some of their deliverables so that you have a benchmark for what a really good example is of a submission. This team made it to the finals last year, and they're featured in Code Girl. So that's also exciting. And they are called Team Amica. And you can see when you log in as a mentor or a coach, you can go to the Teams Gallery, which I'm pointing to with my pointer here. And you can search for Teams, which is what I did here. So let's see what they had. Here are their screenshots. So they submitted, it looks like one, two, three, four, five. And each one shows what the app is doing when it's actually a prototype. And I'm going to read to you their 100-word description. So we'll judge from that. And if you also want to take out your judging rubric, this could be a really great time and exercise for you to do. You can also do this after the session. But um, let's see if the app description actually matches what they submitted. So. They say, Safeguard Driving addresses the issue of impaired driving by evaluating whether a subject might be either under the influence or excessively tired and therefore unfit to drive. The test is comprised of two cognitive components, reaction and balance. So you can see from the screenshot that they do that. Um, points are accumulated by successfully completing tasks. If the subject fails, options for getting home safely will be provided via direct message to a family member, friend, or driving service. Cool. We hope to partner with automobile companies for ignition interlocks if a user fails. Or our primary focus is teens, but we have the potential to expand to adults or the elderly. So that's a really comprehensive, you can see how much can go into 100 words here. If anything really sticks out to anyone, feel free to just make a note of it in the chat. I thought it was really a great example, and so did Ali, and that's why we wanted to show that to you. And now we're going to look at their pitch video, because I want you guys to know the difference between a pitch video and a demo video. Um, some of the students looking at their submissions um, didn't differentiate this as well. So these are two really good examples. Let's jump into the pitch video. to go home. Are you sure you're okay to drive? Did your mom make you get that app to make sure you're okay? Yeah, she did. I guess I should take it. She's probably expecting a text to confirm I took it anyway. Oh my god! They told me that they don't recommend me to drive and that I failed. I honestly thought I was okay to drive. Most people do, and that's how they end up getting hurt. 
Thank you for taking the test. Although I thought you knew better than to be under the influence, I'd much rather you get home safe than drive and put yourself in danger. Thanks for picking me up. No problem. I'm glad you're safe. Let's get home now. Every day in the United States, 28 people are killed as a result of drunk driving accidents. Amika's goal is to prevent people with impaired vision and slowed mental processing from driving under the influence of drugs or alcohol. The user will take a series of three cognitive tests, including balance and reaction time, to assess the user's ability to drive. Our technology will then suggest whether or not it is safe for the user to drive to their destination. If the user passes the test, we will warn them of the dangers of driving on the road and that they should only drive if they feel safe. If the user fails the test, our app will give the user a few different options. The user is able to notify their emergency contacts, call a local taxi service, or use other apps like Uber. A study by researchers in Australia showed that being awake for 18 hours produced an impairment equal to a blood alcohol concentration of 0.05 and 0.1 after 24 hours. 0.08 is considered legally drunk. According to data from Australia, England, Finland, and other European nations, all of whom have more consistent crash reporting procedures than the United States, drowsy driving represents 10 to 30 percent of all crashes. By having teens take our test, we are not in any way trying to take away the responsibility given to them. We just want them to have an option for both themselves and their parents, because drunk driving does not only happen often, but it also affects the lives of many people. Some who get in their cars and never once drive impaired, yet suffer the consequences of others driving dangerously. Our app is just a recommendation, and although it will give fairly accurate results, it only suggests the user's driving capability given their situation. We believe our app has the potential to extend our app's focus onto adults, including the elderly. Although our app has a main focus on driving under the influence, the test is also compatible for testing people who are impaired through tiredness. We also plan on partnering with a car company for ignition interlock features. Using these features, parents will be able to ensure that teens take the test prior to starting their car. This type of technology would separate us from other apps being developed in this field. Our ultimate goal is to keep our peers safe and to prevent as many deaths as possible. We feel it is crucial to keep our friends and family out of the reach from the possible effect that impaired driving has on people. As a team, we sent out multiple surveys to the parents and received positive feedback. Approximately 90% said our app was one they would use for their children. Team Amika is hoping to make a change in our community. And with the Safeguard Driving app, we know there will be a significant difference. Wow, I think I want that app. <laughs> So I should also mention that this team went to the state house, I think, and met their local politician. And these are some of the cool outcomes that happen when girls make apps because they're doing a civic kind of justice to, to their locality. And so it, it offers a lot of potential to meet with really interesting people in the community. So can you guys write in the chat what really stuck out to you in this video? I, there are so many things that I was impressed with, but I'd love to hear from you too. And if you see, if you just take a look at the screenshot there now, you'll see that the student um, underneath her name is the role that she played on the team. And that's really a great technique. Um, they told the story. They have plans to develop it further. Everyone in the team was involved, definitely. Um, it's great when not just one person gets up and talks about it. Um, they combine the story with data. They did their research. You could hear some of the questions that they were asking on their survey. They really care about the cause, and that comes through. Yeah, they own it. They articulated. They spoke clearly. So this has all the key ingredients of a winning kind of submission. They look engaged and concerned about the problem. That's for sure. It's personal to them. So this is where you're going to want to work with your teams pretty early on to make sure that they're very passionate about the cause because that's going to come through, especially in these videos that they're making as their submission. Now, I wanted to show you also a dem the demo video. Whoops, I got ahead of myself here. <laughs> I wanted to show you the demo video just so you have a basic idea of how these are different. This is only about two minutes long. Hello, we are Team Amika, and this video is a demonstration of our Safeguard Driving App prototype. 
Once the app is opened, the user will press the button that says Begin on the main welcome page. The user will be required to complete five consecutive tests. If a test is completed correctly, they earn one point. The maximum number of points that can be earned is five points. The next screen will take you to an emergency contact fill-in, where the user is asked to enter the phone number of their contact. The first test is the Stroop test. The color name will remain on the screen for one second. On the next screen, the driver will be asked to identify the color in which the text was displayed. Four choices will be given. The second test is the arrow test. The driver is asked to identify which arrow is different from the others. He or she has three seconds to make a choice. The third test is the balance test. The driver must move the ball to the line by tilting the screen and must then keep the ball on the black line for five seconds. <laughs> the arrow test is repeated. The position of the arrow which points opposite to the others will be different than it was in test two. The Stroop test is also repeated. The color name and text font color will be different than they were in test one. If the driver earns either four or five total points, they pass the safeguard driving test. The car's ignition system can be started. If the driver earns three points or less, they fail the test. The car's ignition system cannot be started and options for getting home safely will be displayed on the screen. Cool. So that is the basic difference. Um, you don't see a huge story being unfurled in this demonstration video. It's pretty straightforward, which is why it, it only needs to be about two minutes long. So Audra brings up a really cool point in the chat, and that she says she knows it's a competition, but at her school they, they ran a mock pitch, and a handful of staff members reviewed the judging rubric and provided feedback to the girls before the regional event. They felt it was valuable, and then it definitely helped them with the regionals. As the girls ask the teachers, they're more likely to get buy-in. I would definitely use that judging rubric, create events like this, have them rehearse as many times as possible, because it's only going to improve their communication skills and strengthen their chances if they pull together a really strong deliverable. So all of these activities can combine to make a really powerful submission. Use the judging rubric at various points because the students need to know what's expected of them. And the rubric might be hard for them to understand, so you're going to need to help them interpret it and, and give them really good feedback throughout the process. I have, um, we don't have time to go over other high school entries or middle school, but I just included them in the presentation so that you can revert back to them. And I think it would be great before you begin meeting with your teams to actually sit down with that rubric and write down notes on it for each team or video that you're watching so that you can consider what feedback you might have given that team. As you need to practice too. And the more you do these things, the more you'll be able to kind of recognize when something is really working well and how to give input on that. So I thought we'd wrap this up by talking a little bit about what success looks like because you guys are coaches and you're also mentors. And in that sense, you're going to have some similar goals. So when you're in school, and if you're a woman especially, um, I can say for my part that when I was growing up, I didn't see many women in science roles. I didn't see women as engineers. I thought that math and science and all that wasn't for me. And this is exactly the problem we're trying to combat, because if we don't catch girls in middle school or high school who have a fixed mindset that say, I can't do this, I don't like it, it's not for me, if they think that they can either only succeed or fail and they don't want to risk failing, then that is exactly the kind of mindset we're trying to change. Um, some examples of that are they're unwilling to take risks. They give up easily. They don't see the value of effort. Um, they feel threatened by the success of others. And these are all sort of negative traits that don't lead to success in some kind of jobs later. Um, you're going to want to help them improve or grow their mindset. And you can model this behavior for them by 
being able to say, I don't know the answer to this question, but I think I know how we can work together to find out the answer. Um, you don't have to be an expert. You just have to know how to talk about things and to not unpack at the failure points that your team will have and um, help them to get over those points because there will be some times like that where it is kind of difficult and the team needs to pull together and that's when they need you the most. Um, to illustrate what a, a growth mindset is, they find effort and value in work. So it's not about the end result necessarily, it's about the process. And they're willing to try new things. You can see on this diagram that they recoup from failure and then they, it leads to a future success. And then they realize that they can try and fail and they're not losers, you know. Um, they keep trying despite the failures and they find feedback useful. So once you get into this feedback loop with them and it works positively, that's when you know you're, you're succeeding with them. Any questions about growth mindset? There's so many cool videos. Um, at the end, I'll show you a link to one. We won't have time to watch it together, but you should totally watch it after this. And I also thought Bloom's Taxonomy was kind of cool. Bloom's Taxonomy is actually from the 1940s or 50s, and it's a set of models that were created in education conferences, and they're meant to classify educational learning objectives into levels of complexity and mastery. For those who are in the U.S. and we're dealing with Common Core or Next Gen Science Standards, none of this will be new to you. But um, for those who aren't familiar with it, I think it's cool because we can show you the kinds of questions that will lead to higher level thinking and critical thinking. Um, you can use this to understand skill development and understand when your students are asking questions like this, you know that success is happening with them. Um, this is sort of the backbone, backbone to a lot of teaching philosophies. So let's just quickly take a look at this pyramid. At the bottom, you'll see your member. Um, that's when kids are learning facts and they're able to display the knowledge. Um, even everybody in pre-K <laughs> can sort of use that. That's a pretty low-level cognition. And then understanding is being able to extrapolate info and compare and state some main ideas. Um, apply in the middle there is using acquired knowledge, solving problems in new situations. So applying their knowledge to new facts. And that's a skill that a lot of companies today want students to have. It's not enough to have a degree anymore. You have to be able to show that you're able to assimilate information on the fly and use that to create new information or understanding. On top of that is analyze, so break info into little parts um, or identify motives and causes. So we talked about that with high schoolers. Um, they're starting to study cause and effect. Evaluate, um, that's to the second to the top. Be able to present your opinion based on criteria. So that's exactly what we're doing with Technovation. And then create is at the very top, and that's putting together all the parts to make a whole. Um, W-H-O-L-E, <laughs> and compiling information in new and different ways. And the kinds of questions that you can ask or the kinds of questions students might be asking are demonstrated in all these zones. So take note mentally when you're hearing questions, model asking questions to your students. This will let you know whether you are being successful. Uh, we want to move students away from the yes or no questions um, to obviously open-ended or critically thinking ones. So these are examples of the kinds of questions or words you'll be hearing. Um, I mentioned the science of character, and this is a Tiffany Schlein video. She does these cloud films, and every year she focuses on a different theme. Maybe it was last year or so she focused on the science of character. And this is really cool because it talks about creativity and curiosity. Some of the main words that they found were, were really imperative to building character are to the right here. Um, you'll see curiosity and grit, persistence, um, things like that. If you go to the website, um, you can Google it, Science of Character um, and Tiffany Schlein. There is a whole website about learning more about your personality and which, which positive attributes you have so that you can talk to about that with your students. Um, I found out, for instance, one of my top attributes was love of beauty. 
And that was really interesting. And I hadn't thought about myself that way. And I think when students are in a slump and they're having a really hard time, um, touching back on the science of character and talking a little bit about um, their their problems and their breakthroughs are really key to this whole process of building character. So um, for next time, oh, I just wanted to remind you that we have Google groups. I'm going to say this every time we meet because I want you all to join them. Allie created one for mentors, and the link is there. You'll have this presentation after, so you don't have to write it down now. And I created one for coaches. And my plan is to start having weekly meetups where we talk about what's going on in the curriculum. Um, we talk about shared resources, new ones, old ones, whatever. And we all work together to create a community for ourselves so that we can help problem solve and support each other. I hope you guys join. Um, please do after this because we would love to have you there. There's already been some activity in these, so you'll already see things there. And then finally for tomorrow, we're going to talk about App Inventor. And these are two things I would like for you to do. So there are some videos that talk about um, using App Inventor and technology education. It's a cool interview with Youth Radio, which is based in the Bay Area, and Hal Abelson, who's one of the creators of App Inventor. And then there's a tutorial you could get a jump start on. We'll watch that tomorrow as well. But if you want to start setting up App Inventor on your laptop, you'll need a Gmail account. So this is part B. And then go to this website that there is a link to so that you can get started. You don't have to have an Android device to use the emulator. This is all based in the cloud with App Inventor. But towards the end, when students are working on their prototypes, you'll definitely want to get your hands on, a, on an Android device. So I would keep this in mind, unless they're designing with Swift and everyone has iPhones. So that's about it for today. That's a wrap. Does anybody have any questions? If you do, please sign up for, um, I'm going to go back to this, <laughs> the Google group. And let us know what your questions are before we sign out of this call in another minute or so. And I just want to thank you all very much. You guys have taken a lot of time out of your days, and we really appreciate it. And we're hoping to get you guys set up for success. So if you can join us tomorrow, we would love to have you again. All right. I'm going to say thanks and goodbye then. Bye, everybody. Thank you.